Good morning, this is Wendy Downing, pastor of the Steelville Presbyterian Church. Today is Palm Sunday, and our, our uh, sermon title is The Longest Journey, based on John 12, verses 12 through 19. Let us pray. O oh God, we lay down the palm branches, and with them we lay down our belief that there is another way for you to be God. As the last echo of the final Alleluia fades, so does our hope that this journey can end in any other way. The week stretches ahead gloryless and painful, whether we walk with all faith or none. We look towards the cross, knowing it is both the most human and most divine of all journeys. As we look at this long journey today, let us travel the road with courage, with love, and with the uneasy peace that is the gift of faith into this holiest of weeks. Amen. John 12, 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd had come to the festival that heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took the branches of palm trees and went out to, the, to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on the donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered all these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. The story is told of little Billy. He visited his grandmother in California one summer and almost wore her out with his vigorous, rambunctious activity. She was accustomed to living a peaceful, orderly life, and Billy was perpetually in motion, always into everything, turning Grandma's world upside down. One night when they were both asleep, there was an earthquake, and Grandmother was awakened by the noise of things breaking in the house, and the house was shaking. In her concern, she called out, Billy! Billy! To which came Billy's response. I didn't do it, Grandma, I promise. Well, Billy was like a little earthquake at times to a grandma who liked her quiet, orderly, structured lifestyle. I share that story with you because it is by our actions and reactions that we, we reveal ourselves day by day. And so we are known by one another. It is by our interactions with others that we paint, stroke by stroke, the portrait of who we are. In the events preceding and following Palm Sunday, entry into Jerusalem, the actions of Jesus speak volumes about who he was. Knowing that suffering and death lay ahead of him, if he went to Jerusalem, he still charted his course during the Passover celebration. We backtrack today because all through Lent we have been looking at Jesus' final words that he said after Palm Sunday Parade. But those words have been we've been looking at are a part of the events following Palm Sunday that tell us who Jesus really is. Today we look at Jesus, how his last week began. In our scripture text this morning, it was Passover time, and Jews had come from all points to gather in Jerusalem. The law required that every adult, male, Jew, who lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem had to come to the holy city. But wherever Jews lived, it was their ambition to observe at least one Passover in their lifetime in Jerusalem. So as you might expect, the city swelled with worshipers and excited pilgrims. Also during Passover, messianic hopes and expectations ran unusually high. People yearned deeply for their Messiah, their deliverer, 
their king to come and appear. And bear in mind that the Sadducees and the Roman guard, who were the most concerned with keeping order, were always edgy during this time, afraid that some incident or turn of events might ignite the smoldering hostility and desire for freedom, which were always just beneath the surface of an uneasy peace. According to John's account, Jesus had come to nearby Bethany to see about his good friend Lazarus. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and the news about this great happening had reached Jerusalem with its curious, restless, hopeful crowds. So as Jesus headed toward Jerusalem, he was accompanied by an enthusiastic crowd that had been with him in Bethany and who had witnessed his mighty work. Word went ahead with that Jesus, the person who had raised Lazarus from the dead, was coming to town. And when the joyful Bethany crowd met the expectant Jerusalem crowd amid the atmosphere of celebration and anticipation that surrounded Passover, a spontaneous combustion of excitement and passion broke out. John tells us that the Pharisees took one look at the display of emotions and said, It's out of control. The whole place is in a stampede after him. It appears that Jesus actually encouraged and promoted this public demonstration, knowing full well that it would enrage the Jewish leaders and disturb the Roman overlords. But we know that Jesus wasn't promoting this parade to gain any glory for himself. Jesus knew that he was setting into motion the events that would lead him beyond Palm Sunday, through Good Friday, and ultimately to Easter sunrise. Jesus was not a puppet on a string or a victim of circumstances and chance. He virtually orchestrated the movements of his own life that last week. He entered the city knowing that he would be swept by the wave of enthusiasm into the hand of the opposition. He knew all that lay ahead, but he entered Jerusalem anyway. Jesus entered Jerusalem because he knew it would lead him beyond Palm Sunday, and you and I must journey beyond Palm Sunday in our attitudes toward life. We must go beyond Palm Sunday in our devotion to Jesus Christ. We must move beyond Palm Sunday in our faith commitment and our level of loyalty. Going beyond Palm Sunday is all about discovering a faith that is louder than words, deeper than emotions, and stronger than death. When we stay with Jesus and make that long journey from Palm Sunday to Easter morning, we discover two important truths. First, we learn what the Christian life is really all about. Only one person ever fully lived the Christian life. That person, of course, was Jesus. Jesus modeled for us the supreme example of what it means to be truly faithful, truly Christian. What we strive to do is to allow a reflection of that great life to be seen in us, our actions, attitudes, relationships. So what did Jesus teach us about the Christian life by being willing to go beyond Palm Sunday during the final week of his earthly life and ministry? He shows us that the Christian life has nothing to do with the love of power, but everything to do with the power of love. Jesus could have made a grand entry into our world, but he became a babe in Bethlehem's manger. Jesus could have accepted the tempter's terms when he was tempted in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. He was tempted to become a popular Messiah, make a big splash by showing taking the showbiz route, and doing a straw hat and cane routine. But he chose the way of humble, obedient service. He refused to seek a high-profile spotlight. Jesus could have taken advantage of the opportunity on that first Palm Sunday to ride the crest of popularity into a position of earthly power and authority. But he knew that his kingdom was not of this world. He knew that the power of love not the love of power, would ultimately triumph. Menelik II was the emperor of Ethiopia in 1889 through 1913. News reached him of a successful new means of dispatching criminals, 
the news about this device known as the electric chair. The emperor immediately ordered one for his country. Unfortunately, no one bothered to warn him that it would never work because Ethiopia at that time had no electricity. But Menelik was determined that his new purchase would not go to waste. So he converted that electric chair into a throne. There was another occasion when an instrument of death became a throne on a, Palestin a Palestinian hillside about 20 centuries ago, when a cross became a throne for one name, for one named Jesus of Nazareth. You see, Jesus refused to ascend to the earthly throne and assume raw political power. He chose instead to trust the power of self-giving love. His only throne was a cross. One of the first Christian missionaries to Uganda, East Africa, was Bishop Hannington. He was killed by the natives, and just as the emissaries of the African chieftain were arriving to do him in, he shouted, Go tell your king that I will open the road to Uganda with my life. That is what Jesus was doing, opening the road to eternity with his own life. You see, the Christian life is not about being catered to, but about serving. The Christian life is not about grasping selfishly, but about giving sacrificially. The Christian life is not about the love of power, but about the power of love. Secondly, when we stay with Jesus and make that long journey from Palm Sunday to Easter morning, we learn that regardless of how things appear, our greatest victory is just around the corner. The best is yet to be. Carl Sandburg wrote a multi-volume set of books on the life of Abraham Lincoln. One volume has a chapter entitled Palm Sunday 65. It was about a date, the date April 9th, 1865, when Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. On that Palm Sunday, the war ended and peace began to reign. A few skirmishes flared up here and there until everyone finally got the word that the war was over. It was not a bad, that is not a bad analogy to what happened on the day that Jesus, of Jesus' last ride into Jerusalem. God's peace plan was being presented to humanity. There would be no compromise. A skirmish broke out on Friday, but the battle was essentially over. Jesus faced the hostile forces opposed to him, armed only with the power of self-giving love, but that was enough. When I was in seminary, I became good friends with a foreign pastor from Ghana. He was actually a bishop in his own country, but to us, he was just Solomon. Solomon told me over dinner one night that he always loved to receive a phone call from home. He said that whenever he heard a cheerful voice from home, it instantly changed his mood for the better, because no matter how dark or difficult the day was, it let him know that there would be a tomorrow, a time when he would get to go home again. That's, <clears throat> that's what the Christian can realize during dark, difficult times. There will be a tomorrow. There will be a sunrise. There will be triumph. God is always working things out for our good. Our victory is always just around the corner. James Stewart tells a story of a painting of Faust. Faust is a fictional character who gambles with Satan for his soul. The painting depicts a game of chess, with Faust and the devil facing each other across the board. The game is nearing the end, and Faust has only a few pieces remaining, a king, a knight, and a couple of pawns. Faust gazes at the board with a look of blank despair. Opposite him, Satan leers in anticipation of his imminent victory. Checkmate appears inevitable. One day a chess master stood gazing at the painting. At first he was fascinated by the agony and despair etched into the features of Faust's face. Then he noticed the pieces on the board, and the chess master became absorbed in the possibilities of the game. Other visitors entered and departed the gallery, but the chess master still studied the board intently. <coughs> Excuse me. Oblivious to anything else around him, suddenly the silence was shattered as he exclaimed, 
It's a lie. The picture is a lie. The king has another move. No matter how dark the hour this week as we worship together on Monday, Thursday, and remember Jesus' last supper with his disciples, no matter how dark the hour this week when we worship together on Good Friday and his prayer in Gethsemane, and remember Jesus' death on the cross, no matter how dark the hour this week, and there will be some dark, difficult days, this day, Palm Sunday, began the most difficult week of Jesus' life. It didn't end it. The message of Palm Sunday, the message of Christ and the cross, the message of the triumphal entry, Good Friday, and the crucifixion is the message that God is not checkmated. The gospel has come. <clears throat> the gospel has not come to the end of the line. The king still has another move. That's the message we learn when we take the longest journey with Jesus this week. Thanks be to God. Amen.